Welcome everyone. Thank you for attending our first interview of the day. Today, we are interviewing Kardik Satyanarayan and Gita Seshmani of Wildlife SOS in India. And we will be talking today about uplifting communities while protecting wildlife. This interview is part of a larger series on animal protection issues and sustainable development which the Animal Issues Thematic Cluster of the United Nations is organizing in connection with this year's annual high-level political forum, which is currently ongoing. Thank you so much, um, Gita and Kardik, for joining us today. You're very welcome, Wolf. It's great to be here with you. Thank you for having us on the show. Absolutely. My first question, how has Wildlife SOS used community development to combat wildlife crime and animal abuse? So Wildlife SOS has used community development in a variety of ways to combat um, you know, animal abuse. The first thing uh, we've done quite successfully is to understand what the basic root is for people to get involved in animal abuse. And very often it's, it's history. There's a historical fact where that community has been using um, animals in an exploitative way. And uh, without realizing it, they've kind of ruled themselves out of other options to support themselves with another livelihood. And so when you can understand those roots and you isolate them, and then if you can do a needs assessment with those communities and understand what is it that they really need and why is it that they are abusing animals, then it's, some, it's very easily possible to help them walk away from it. And uh, would you like to give the example of the bears? Well, wildlife crime and abuse we have found usually happens with a combination of poverty and ignorance backed up by culture and tradition. So, for example, when Wildlife SOS began to work with the dancing bears of India, we lived with the community, we stayed in their villages, and we realized that the problem was that through over 400 years, they had only done this one thing to earn a living, which is to get hold of poached baby bear cubs, bring them in into their villages, train them, and use them to get money from tourists, or use them on the public, with the rural public, and collect money or food. So we realized that if we could provide them with options, if we could take this very marginalized nomadic community and mainstream them, give them an option with health care, of education, perhaps they would have a better quality of life. And that is the tactic that Wildlife SOS used, community development altogether, to try and wean them away from the use of wildlife uh, for earning a living. It was immensely successful because it was sustainable, because we gave them an alternative. Sometimes when it is organized wildlife crime, uh, and poaching is of a different quality and caliber altogether, as often happens for uh, cats, big cats, and for many other species that are being used for wildlife trade and for medicine. In that case, sometimes doing awareness or using community development doesn't always work. But in our case, we were immensely successful because we worked with one specific nomadic community and we were able to uh, rid India of the barbaric practice of dancing bears altogether. Plus, I think we brought a huge difference, uh, a quality of life to the entire Kalandar community. How has the standard of living for Kalandar people improved as a result of Wildlife SOS's intervention? The standard of living uh, for the community has improved substantially because uh, by enabling them and empowering them with education and additional support. Um, we've also helped them with finding alternative livelihoods that were sustainable, which, were, which did not involve animal abuse or exploitation of wildlife. 
we give we help them with alternative livelihoods when they had already proved to us that they would not go back to exploiting wildlife and by doing that we were able to ensure that they had a sustainable future their children could get education uh, and they could they could stay away from going back to uh, you know exploiting wildlife and i think that has made a world of difference for them because it's been able to create sustainability for their lives and it's it's been possible for them to fulfill their dreams you know and and their dreams were simple was as simple as drinking water toilets basic health care you know escape and and protection from loan sharks and a sustainable um, revenue which would ensure that they did not have to go back to begging on the streets so uh, and and sometimes as simple as you know a shelter on their roofs i mean there are roofs above their head and uh, i think wildlife resources was able to intervene and assist them with all of these components geeta can give you some examples we began with very grassroots uh, uh, wolf for example their biggest need was drinking water and so we literally helped them not just buy the submersible but they actually did the digging and they set up the well so every village we visited or we stayed in we ensured that they had a well and they could get drinking water uh, the women in the villages usually were very silent and did not have much to say in community life by giving them options of uh, self -he self help options giving them training in embroidery patchwork quilts things which they were already doing very well but we helped them to make it uh, make it earn for them they were able to get a meal for their children even if their husbands were out of the village that kind of simple activities ensured that the women got a say in their community the women became second income earners sending the children to school was again a win-win situation the moment the child would go to school he'd want to be a part of the com larger community outside his own village or tribe he wanted he he could start dreaming of different ways of earning a living we looked after the whole thing we gave them their books their satchels their shoes their sweaters whatever they needed to be like other children in the beginning we were not very successful and we found the reason for that was they needed tuition and help because they were the first generation uh, children going to school so we started setting up small tutorial centers in every village so when they came back home uh, they could do their homework and there would be a teacher there to guide them so this kind of assistance made sure that the children did well in school and the women in particular we empowered by giving them small seed funds to do things like make snacks and sell them uh, taught them stitching candle making agarbatti making uh, anything which would help them to earn some money on the side so i think it was a sort of a well packaged thing for the entire community now many people ask us that did you only help the people who had uh, wildlife or who had the dancing bears no the moment a village was cleared of all the dancing bears the entire community came in for an, for the upliftment programs so we set up a kind of a peer pressure where nobody went back to wildlife wildlife trade or bringing in other animals because they knew that the village the entire village as a whole would lose the help that we were giving them and so everybody in the village benefited whether it was from water whether it was from the toilets the very poor families got roofing help to get uh, what we call pakka houses that is roofing for their homes all weather roofing um, children getting educated young girls for their marriages we helped them uh, so that they could uh, they could attain the majority age of 18 before they got married now in this community there was a lot of child marriage girls were being married off at the age of 9 and 10 because the community could not afford to feed their children after we started helping them child marriage stopped completely and the women were at least 18 or 19 before they got married now that was of immense health benefit uh, to the community as a whole because the women were mature when they finally got married so these kind of things we've been working with in the community and it's an ongoing project you know it was it's much easier to take the bears and look after them in our centers uh, and the community work has to be ongoing for a much longer time it's our third decade now You mentioned community needs assessments. 
Overall, how much agency do members of the Kalendar community have in determining and expressing their own needs in the development process? Uh, in fact, uh, Wolf, you'd be happy to know that the entire intervention process and the alternative livelihood support system uh, gave them complete agency to do that because the needs assessment identified what their skill sets were, what uh, kind of alternative livelihoods would suit them best because they had not had too much of experience in a great deal of manual labor, but they were street smart. And that's what, one of the things we were able to identify through the needs assessment process, that they were street smart, they had the gift of the gab, they could survive on the streets, but they needed some amount of handholding. And so I would say we never forced or thrust any kind of alternative livelihood down their throat unless we were sure that, you know, they, and it was, it was something that they could handle. So in fact, there was nothing that was forced upon anyone. If somebody felt that they could sell, you know, vegetables or somebody felt they could ride a tuk-tuk and that, those were the kind of specific alternatives that we found for them and, and gave them a lot of hand-holding to ensure that they got to do what they liked. But if they were going back to using animals, we would gently discourage them and help them identify um, you know, proper methods of livelihoods that would be profitable for them while staying away from any form of animal use. You can add some examples, Gita. Well, uh, we, are not all, we were not always 100% successful uh, in the sense that the first time uh, a man might decide that he's going to have a push cart on which he's going to sell uh, bread and eggs along the highway to the truck drivers. And he may not be very successful, uh, let's say, with the first venture that he does. Sometimes if there was an illness in the family or if a parent became very sick, they would simply sell off everything to be able to take care of that parent. And then we'd have to start again from scratch. So I think the lesson that they really learned was how to manage their finances, how to keep a little aside, how to keep buying stocks and making sure that their little shops, their tea shops or their welding units, their um, juice, uh, juice shops, whatever that they had ventured on would not stop functioning completely if there was a family crisis. So. These were the kind of lessons they learned on the ground, how to manage their money. And the women were very successful with that. I remember one particular example where the women, the middlemen used to bring waste leather to the women in the village and they would cut it into small pieces uh, to stuff into cricket balls. That's what, what was being made, manufactured. And the women were making barely 12 rupees a day because the middleman because uh, these women did not feel comfortable going out to the factory guys and dealing with them directly. Uh, the women were losing most of their money to the middlemen. Then finally, 40 of them got together and they said, if you bring us one truckload of leather, we will not ask you for help again. We will completely uh, manage the, uh, the, uh, the show ourselves. And that's what they did after we gave them the first truckload they started making those cricket balls, they dealt with the factory people directly, and they did very well, very well. I'd like to add uh, that in many cases, like Geeta mentioned, you know, there were um, failures, but those failures taught us uh, about more about the community and how we could ensure their success. So if a man set, who had set up a tea shop was unable to, you know, make ends meet, then we would, our team would go out there and analyze what were his failures, what were the shortcomings. And you know, if it was that he wasn't able to stock things rightly, his things were getting spoiled, then we would help him with storage or advice and find alternative vendors who would make sure that they would extend credit which would help him sustain his shop. And the goal was to ensure that every family could support themselves sustainably and never have to go back to using animals for a living. Did you provide any kind of startup funding for people in the calendar community to get their businesses started? Or did you make contacts with investors who are willing to support them financially? 
we obviously had to invest in seed funding to make sure that you know we could prove to them that our interest was in their success because uh, initially when Geeta and I started working with the Kalandar community they did see us as people who were trying to snatch away their livelihood and they thought we were there to take away their bears etc so we worked with the government and the forest department and the enforcement authorities so there was a process that they followed with the Kalandar community and once the forest department had confiscated the bear or rescued the bear and handed it over to Wildlife SOS and it was received at our rescue center that is when we identified those families and our team then went to their villages verified the information that they had provided us about their existing livelihood their state of life their status and things like that and then we extended to them uh, support for alternative livelihoods and we said well now that you don't have a bear anymore this is what we can help you with your need assessment has indicated that you would like to drive a tuk-tuk and yes a tuk-tuk would give them you know um, maybe 20 times more income than what a bear would get them which means his family's status community support all of that would change for the family and his children could go to school so we would then set up a bank account for the for that family ensure and then we extended about two thousand dollars worth of support in rupees uh, into the in, as seed funds because we were very conscious that no seed fund ever be mistaken for uh, and mistaken and used as a reason for people to go and acquire animals so before that could happen we had ensured that all of the bears had been microchipped and was a process that we did with the forest department at every stage and then once the seed funds were provided we then verified at every stage so that you know there was no chance that they would fail or lose their investment and then we would make sure that the tuk-tuk was given to them they had training as a driver they got a license in place they learned the ropes of how to uh, function as a tuk-tuk driver on the streets of of that region where they lived and that's how we we ensured that they were successful and it was a win-win for the community and for wildlife as well as for the enforcement authority however i must um, and uh, you know emphasize here that the at all times of this process you know the enforcement authorities were constantly watching for anyone who would violate this process and go back to you know breaking the law and if that happened then the law would of course take its course and people who would break the law would be punished so that helped to discourage the community from going back to using wrong methodologies or going back to exploiting wildlife and it encouraged them to stay on the right track and and work with us to provide uh, and create for themselves an alternative livelihood either you can give some examples if you have any well, one thing that we started was embroidery and um, uh, stitching centers in almost every village that we worked. This helped the women to make sure that their children were well clothed, so they had a place where they could go and ensure proper dressing and clothes for their children. Uh, more than that, also, they could reach out to the villages around them and start stitching for local needs so that they could make some kind of an income. I think other examples of... Uh, we, we also had some examples uh, where men were uh, able to create environmental friendly plates using leaves and it required a machine okay. to create that. So we helped set up those machines and those workstations. We also set up uh, training centers where they could be trained in different kinds of skills like welding, fabrication and things like that. Just to you know, give you a few examples. A note to our viewers, if you want to ask any questions, you may do so using the chat feature. And then towards the end of the interview, if there are any questions, I will select from among them to present Gita and Kardec for answering. Um, my next question, could you please elaborate a little bit on 
the specific ways in which the Kalendar community traditionally used wildlife, um, including bear dancing. If you could explain a little bit about what that practice is and what it entails. Uh, they used a variety of wildlife initially. For example, they had uh, a great horned owls, they kept mongoose, they kept monkeys, and used them for dancing. But I think mainly it could be a civet cat, uh, any wildlife at all, because it wasn't only bear dancing. What they would do is they made talismans, they made rings, they collected herbs from the forest and uh, prepared different kinds of herbal medicines. So to attract a crowd around them to um, ensure that they got the attention of the rural folk, they would usually have an animal with them. And uh, that's how they would use wildlife. So they would drag around a mongoose. Sometimes it would be a civet cat. Sometimes it would be an owl perched on their shoulder. And they would take this around just to, I feel, just to attract the rural public towards them and then spread out their wares. And their money usually came from uh, the herbs, the medicines, the talismans, and things like that. Where the bear was concerned, it's really interesting. The bear was seen as an animal of great power with control over the underworld. And for the rural public, where health care, particularly uh, psychiatric problems, psychological problems, there's no one there to help them with, uh, they would use the bear as a kind of, um, as a kind of a, what would you say, a god, so that a hair from the bear would be like a talisman which could stop a child who's bedwetting or if there's a child who suffers from colic very frequently, he'd wear a bear claw. If there was a 17-year-old girl who was hysterical and prone to fits of hysteria, they would put her, put her on top of the bear and then take her around in a circle. So there were a lot of superstitious, uh, superstitions associated with the bear, and the bear as having the capacity to cure many illnesses. And the Kalandra was smart enough to exploit uh, this kind of uh, thinking amongst the rural public too. So that's how they use their wildlife. Also, I'd like to elaborate that the way these bears were used is also important for us to, to know where they would, uh, you know, they would work closely with tribal poachers. The Kalanda community would acquire the bear cubs from tribal poachers and then the, the welfare of the bears left a lot to be desired for because they would use a red hot iron poker, heat it up, and then when it's red hot, they would actually you shove it through the muzzle, the delicate muzzle of the, of the baby bear, and sometimes through the cheek, and they would do this multiple times during a year. And then a thick, coarse rope would be thrust through that hole. Uh, and, and if you uh, were unfortunate enough to witness something like that, which is very painful to watch, you can smell the searing flesh as it burnt and the, the baby bear would of course yowl in pain and distress. But that pain and fear is what uh, enabled them to make the bear perform and dance on the streets. Uh, and that's, so basically that rope through the muzzle would be yanked uh, and uh, the bear would be dragged using that. And that is why the, and when they would flick it up, the pain would cause the bear to hop up and down in distress. And that would be viewed as dancing. Sadly, uh, it was a roadside, you know, entertainment for the public and tourists. And uh, and we are very glad that Wildlife SOS was able to eradicate the entire practice while ensuring sustainable alternative livelihoods for the community. So uh, we ended up rescuing 628 bears across India and, and helping about 3,000 families. So this practice is now behind us. And I'm, I'm glad that, you know, we were able to do it in this lifetime. You've addressed this some already, but can community development replace um, more traditional punishment-based approaches to wildlife crime? Or does it require the backing of strong law enforcement in order to succeed? One definitely needs both things. Uh, one definitely needs the law to be there because it's only fear of the law that might bring about uh, some kind of obedience or some kind of um, um, the ability to carry out reform and to change things. If you're not backed by a strong law, then you're on a very weak wicket. 
Um, if just ignorance has to be battled or a lack of awareness, then community development can, can be sufficient. But we've always found that it's like the carrot and the stick. You had to do community development and you had to back it up with the law. Yeah, I'd like to add to that and, and say that and reiterate that there is no replacement for enforcement of the law and implementation of the law that is absolutely essential to ensure that people stay within the discipline of the law that exists in that country. However, uh, alternative livelihoods and community development can certainly discourage them from going in the wrong path. You know, they can stay away from getting off the tracks. You can keep them, you know, uh, in the right. You can give them the right decisions, the, empower them to take the right decisions and do the right thing by providing uh, community support. And that includes education, empowerment of women, alternative livelihoods, all of the above. You've mentioned before there are, ca there are cases in which community development can be successful in addressing wildlife crime, but that there are also ca types of wildlife crime situations in which it isn't sufficient. Could you explain a little, a little bit more about what the differences are if one is trying to assess whether or not community development is a practical approach to a given situation? What would be the factors to look for early on? Uh, shall, I, shall I take it? Uh, community development can, uh, like, I, like, I, like we just explained, can be a very, and can play a very supportive role, but you cannot replace law enforcement. So community development can be a huge asset to creating a change, bringing forward a very positive reformation and change in a community that's been involved in, you know, animal abuse or exploitation poaching. of wildlife or poaching of wildlife and things like that. Uh, but at the same time, sometimes communities are very, have very deep rooted instincts, you know, especially if they've been hunter gatherer tribes, you know, for generations, for hundreds of years, if that's all they've done, there is a streak inside of them that despite them going to jail, getting all kinds of support, they will still end up getting tempted to go back to doing it. And in such cases, you know, you might have to use exceptional techniques and methods to ensure they do not stray, you know, uh, towards their uh, habitual offenses, you know, and they, they can tend to become habitual offenders. And I, I think in this particular case, I'd, I'd like to quote some examples of, you know, poachers who've been involved in tiger poaching and they've been caught umpteen times but they get out on bail, disappear, and then they go back to doing it, despite every kind of effort that's been done by the government, you know, to try and change these people and giving them alternatives and opportunities to reform themselves. So in some cases, it can be a challenge. Community development can be, uh, you know, cannot be 100% successful, but in most cases, it, it can. Because if you give a family everything they need, a roof over their head, livelihood, money, support uh, and education for the children and they see that there is a sustainable future for the children which does not need them to go back to doing you know wildlife crimes or offenses towards animals then there is a there's a very good chance that they will not go back to it but in some cases it doesn't work you want to add Gita? i think wolf there is another dimension to wildlife crime which we haven't talked about till now which is in areas of uh, human wildlife conflict areas. We're working a lot with, uh, with this right now. It's becoming one of the uh, more immediate concerns that uh, wildlife in the landscape of human habitation, how does one deal with that? There's such a lot of retaliatory killing, whether it's a tiger, a leopard, a sloth bear, uh, any animal which comes within the peripheries of a, of a village or uh, crosses the what is hypothetically the boundary in the mind of the villagers, it's come into our area. And this kind of retaliatory killing, do we call it a wildlife crime now? Do we, how do we accept this kind of increasing um, death and loss of wildlife that is happening in all, our, um, in all the states of India? So this is another uh, increasing area of worry. 
where, where uh, we are finding that just education and awareness is not going to do the job. And we have to do a different kind of uh, community, uh, community projects with them in terms of compensation if they've lost their livestock or in creating barriers between wildlife in their landscape and them. So that's another very large area of, uh, of uh, where wildlife is losing, its, uh, losing itself in the, in the sense that we're having losses of leopards, tigers, sloth bears, and, and in black fact, bears. And in fact, to add to what you were saying, you know, there's an example which has probably, you know, um, shaken the whole world and shocked everybody about where recently, not, not many weeks ago, uh, an explosive was placed inside a, a food uh, bait and then an elephant ate it, a pregnant young female elephant. And then she, she died because it exploded inside her mouth. And uh, the reason for that was crop protection. So what, what, what is shocking, and uh, in fact is a bit of a surprise to everyone, is that the Indian government and every state government offers crop compensation to farmers. They get paid money if they have a crop loss, which they sustain from wild animals entering their fields. But yet, some of them find it um, you know, um, lucrative to use it, use explosives, <clears throat> because they all not only protect their crops, but they also get food for the pot, which is bush meat, which is sad and unfortunate. And, uh, and you know, it also opens up some questions, which is, you know, how are people, common people able to access explosives so easily? And, you know, why is it that they want to resort to such inhumane and brutal methods when perfectly humane and uh, proper solutions are available, legal solutions are available? But anyway, those are deeper questions that we, we need to you know, look into later on. Do you have any uh, preliminary solutions, success stories, recommendations for dealing with the kind of human wildlife conflict that you've described? Absolutely, we do have some solutions. And in fact, Wildlife SOS has uh, successfully implemented several solutions. And, and the one thing that comes to mind right away Wolf is um, a radio collar, GPS enabled radio collar that we recently installed uh, on a wild elephant herd. So there was this problem where, you know, a big herd of about 20 elephants entered the state of Chhattisgarh, which is in central India, from a different state uh, because of a coal mine, which kind of disturbed their uh, corridor. And the people in central India who were living in that landscape had not seen elephants for, you know, decades, for maybe a couple of hundred years. And suddenly, they were seeing these herds of elephants going through their property. There was, you know, complete mayhem because people didn't know how to behave around elephants. There was loss of property, loss of human lives. People were up in arms and they wanted, you know, the government to take action against the elephants. Thankfully, the government uh, of Chhattisgarh invited us to come and work with them and help them find a solution. And we collaborated with the forest department of that state. And we came up with a, a mechanism which would create an early warning alert system. And we got a GPS enabled radio caller and radio collared the matriarch of that herd. And we actually are able to get real time um, locations of that entire herd and in what direction they are moving in. So that enables our team to get a satellite location of that herd and calculate the speed at which they are moving, how far they are from which village. And then uh, our team passes that on uh, to the forest department and the forest department and our team decimate that, you know, get that information out. And we, were, we are able to alert all of those villages that come in that path of that herd and then the people then get out of their homes bring out their pots and pans and some lights stand outside the village and make a little noise and the elephant herd obviously doesn't want to go towards a herd of people you know making a lot a racket so the herd just disappears and they turn their trajectory elsewhere and you know we are able to save human lives as well as elephants so this is a practical solution that we've implemented and it's worked really well so far, and we hope you know this can be borrowed and emulated in other places as well. Do you have any other suggestions? 
Well, I think there's a loss of wildlife in smaller animals like, you know, boar, wild boar. Uh, uh, hyenas are chased and beaten up. Uh, so uh, we need a, a large number of solutions, and we do need education here because the way in which development and progress is uh, destroying the habitat of the wildlife and the way there's fragmentation of the landscape for the animals, for wildlife particularly, uh, we are going to require a great deal of education so people learn to live with wildlife in their landscape. I mean, that's one huge area of uh, awareness that everybody has to create in different states and in local, in local situations. This solution is a good one of radio collaring large animals like maybe an elephant, but we do have a, large, a great loss of life of smaller wildlife. I think education, like Gita mentioned, is an inescapable requirement, and it's very, very critical that we teach everybody to live with tolerance, that we've got to respect our neighbors, not just humans, but also birds, reptiles, and mammals with equal respect. and, and you know, learn to tolerate them and live with them, live amongst them with peace and harmony. And that I think is a, is a, is a need of the hour. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, there's more action probably than ever to combat the wildlife trade and acknowledging the problems that it poses from a human perspective, as well as a biodiversity and animal protection perspective. Um, but one common concern is that bans on or restrictions on wildlife trade may harm the livelihoods and the sustenance of people who are traditionally dependent on that. Um, do you think that community development like you have um, provided for the calendar people can play a role in addressing that need? Absolutely, without a shred of doubt, um, you know, wet markets or communities that have been harvesting wild animals, you know, for meat or for other purposes, that can easily be replaced. There is no such need at all for, for that to continue. And I think community development can play a major role in such cases. And, uh, but it has to go hand in hand with, with strict law enforcement so that people are not tempted to go take the community development support and go back to what they think is easy money. So it's got to be because wildlife crime and, and wildlife trafficking, unfortunately, is lucrative and it's easy money and it's a you know, multi-billion dollar industry. We've got to be careful about ensuring that there's strong enforcement in place, followed by strong community development initiatives. And you know, wildlife resources is more than happy to provide any information, uh, assistance, guidance, and you know, any any uh, guidelines, uh, research papers, etc. If anybody is interested, but it it certainly can make a huge difference. Will. Last question: Have any people from within the Calendar community who've received community development gone on to become advocates for animals, for wildlife, for conservation themselves? Yes, uh, I think both Gita and I and the entire team of wildlife festivals would be very proud to tell you that about 40% of the staff that work with wildlife festivals currently, out of the 400 odd staff that we have, um, they are from the Kalandar community. And that makes us very proud that we've been able to turn them around full circle. And many of them are advocates for our work. They help us gather intelligence, many of them help us enforce the law and also turn people, you know, and, and get people right back on track if they are going off the track. So I, I think um, one other very proud fact that we do have is that many of the Kalandar community youngsters are now pursuing higher education. So I won't be surprised when we start having doctors and engineers from that community and it'll be a great moment of pride for us that we've been able to help that community get away from illegal exploitation of wildlife, illegal trafficking, and you know, move them uh, in a sustainable way to, towards the right path. You wanna add something? I would like to just give one small example. Uh, we've started doing organic farming, trying to reuse the elephant dung and uh, uh, dung from the other animals that are with us. And 
uh, the people who've turned out to be the best and are the most innovative and are doing so well with our organic farming are the Kalandars themselves. They have uh, developed that as, uh, uh, they've developed that beautifully and we're doing really well in that area, producing uh, self-sustaining vegetables, fruits, for the entire staff as well as for our animals. So they are talented and if we give them the options and the education, they are able to do really well in any field. And you know, just to add to what Geeta said, the organic farm uses elephant dung and cattle dung from our rescue center and we turn, turn that into food. Not, not literally, but we grow food using that. And when you come and visit us, we'll, next time we'll feed you uh, uh, fresh vegetables from the organic farm. I would love that. Thank you so much, Karta Kingita, for your time and for a fascinating interview. It's been wonderful to talk to you again. And thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge with the Animal Issues Thematic Cluster. You're very welcome, uh, Wolf. And we'd like you to also uh, just let people know, any of the viewers, if they want more information that they couldn't participate or ask questions now, they are welcome to contact us on wildlifesos.org and we'd be more than happy to respond to them. I will pass that on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wolf. Thank you for the Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.